Hi, my name is Sadaq Malik, and I do research on AI and interactive pedagogy at the Wharton School. And I'm Ethan Malik, I'm a professor at the Wharton School, also studying AI, pedagogy, entrepreneurship, and innovation. In this second video, we're going to talk to you about foundational models, how these models work, how to use these models, and we'll dive into what each model is good for. So when we talk about foundational model, we are going back to that idea that we talked about in the first video of large language models. So there's lots of AI tools out there, right? And if you follow Twitter or Instagram, you'll see thousands more released every day. What you really need to know, though, is about the core foundational models, the large language models that are available to the world, because almost all of these AI tools are just running on top of or taking advantage of these large language models. So if you understand how to use the large language models directly, that's kind of the most powerful and easiest way to get used to AI, and then you could try out different tools on top of it. So we want to introduce you to three commonly used tools. These are not the only large language models. They they're just the most able and most accessible right now, but there are plenty of other ones coming along the line. So we won't be talking about Anthropics Claude, which is a very good model. We won't be talking about the open source AI models that are out there because we just want to focus on a few for this particular talk. But by the time you watch this video, there may be others or those models may be the ones you want to use. They all operate in fairly similar ways. When we think about AI large language models, we tend to think about OpenAI's ChatGPT. There are two models to choose from with OpenAI. One is 3.5, the original model, and that is free right now. And the other is 4.0. Um, neither of these models at present are connected to the internet. To prompt or give it an instruction or direction, you type right into the bar. And we're going to talk a lot more about how to prompt depending on what you're trying to accomplish in upcoming videos. So those two models, GPT 3.5 and the more powerful GPT 4, are not just available through ChatGPT. They're also available through other sources. So lots of companies use an API, a connection, to talk directly to these models. And the model is actually doing all the AI work, and they're just kind of a surface layer on top of that. The most deeply integrated and easiest way to access GPT-4 other than through uh, ChatGPT is actually to use Microsoft's Bing uh, chatbot. And Bing has three different modes you can pick from, a precise mode, a balanced mode, and a creative mode. And they're constantly tweaking these things. But right now, the creative mode and the precise mode both use GPT-4, the most powerful model. Balanced mode does not. So I would recommend generally staying with creative mode when you're using these systems. And all the prompts we're going to give you, expect you to use creative mode. The big advantage of Bing compared to these other models is that it's connected to the internet, which is very useful. It can actually read and work with documents under some circumstances, which is quite useful. And it also can create images, which we'll talk more about later. So these are all things that Bing can do that ChatGPT cannot, uh, although all those capabilities are coming to ChatGPT soon. And by the time you watch this, they may be happening. But Bing is a free, accessible way available in 169 countries to get access to the more advanced GPT-4 model. The final foundational model that we want to talk about is Google's BARD. Now, BARD actually has many foundational models that they've been putting underneath it. So right now it's using the Palm 2 model. Prior to that, it was using Palm 1. But you don't have to really know which model's under the system. BARD allows you to directly connect to another powerful foundational AI model. Now, as of the time of recording this, BARD is less able than ChatGPT4 or Bing, but that is improving rapidly. And at some point soon, it may be as good or even better than these other models. It works a little bit differently. And some of the prompts that we're going to give you may not work as well with BARD as that they do in ChatGPT. But you'll get to experiment and work with them. And the advantage of BARD is it's free, freely accessible, connected to the internet, and very fast compared to some of the other AMI models that are out there. So again, there are three foundational models that we're talking about. Uh, we're not endorsing one or another, but they are three powerful models. That is Microsoft's Bing, especially in creative mode, OpenAI's ChatGPT 3.5 and 4.0, and Google's Bard. So I'm going to show you the 3.5 and 4 models as we use them here. So 3.5 is very fast, but is slightly less capable. So if I say something like, write me a limerick about why teachers are great. It will do something very quickly. Um, and there's some okay rhymes there. It's not amazing. 
bribes and a rise. Uh, so let's switch to the more capable GPT-4 model. And you might notice there are different versions of GPT-4 models that might be available to you depending on what version of uh, OpenAI software you're using. We're just gonna use the plain version of GPT-4, but there's versions that have tools included in them like web browsing or um, the ability to create code. But let's just say write a limerick about why teachers are great and you will see that the model is both slower and uh, a little more sophisticated as a result. And you'll notice a few features as you do this. There is the ability that you have to, uh, you know, to clear and start chats again, which will start from scratch. Once you've created something, uh, then you can also end up recreating it if you want to. There's a regenerate button that you can use. You can also stop generation if it's not going where you want it to go and ask it to regenerate any response that you had before. The version we're using, we've turned off chat history, which removes some features, but makes the chat more private. OpenAI has promised not to use that to train its models in the future, but I could turn that on and I get access to more features as a result. So that's a privacy balancing act that you'll have to do. You also can edit your replies. So I said here, write a poem. I could say write a poem about teachers now and that will actually change the response. So I now have a second answer. And if I go back, you'll be able to see that I can actually now flip, flip between the different answers I had. So that lets me refine my prompts, something we'll be talking more about. In some cases, I can also copy text from a prompt elsewhere. So I can do all these things using this chat interface. Of course, the interface is updating all the time. So your mileage may be a little bit different. So right now we're gonna talk about Bing and Bing is connected to the internet. There are three different modes. There is precise mode, which you can see here by the green. Balance mode is blue and the creative mode, which is the more powerful model based on 4.0 is the purple. And you can ask it anything you want and it will respond to you. As you can see, it only has right now 20 prompts at a time, but that continues to increase. It will also give you suggestions on where to go next. A lot of the times these suggestions are great. Sometimes they may not be so great. And so you have to decide if you wanna follow its path or your own path after every single prompt. If you wanna start a new topic, you use this broom and you start a new topic. Finally, this is Google Bard, and Google Bard is a little bit different than the two other models we talked about, both of which are powered by OpenAI's model. So they feel very similar to each other, while Bard feels a little bit different. If we say, write me a poem in Bard, we will get the answer all at once, as opposed to in segments, and it will generally be much faster than other models, though, again, it depends on the circumstance. And there's a few things you can do differently. So one thing I can do is I can view other drafts and it provides three different versions. And whichever version I pick, that's the version that the system will continue to use in the future. I can hit reload to get new drafts. And I can, just like uh, other models, edit the chat afterwards and change it to something else. And it will recreate the conversation there. Um, and those options are all useful ones if I want to get going. I also can reset the chat at any point and, and that lets me continue to build things. And there's a few other interesting options here, like the ability to export things directly to documents or Gmail. That will be coming soon to Microsoft products as well. So this will be more integrated in with your regular work tools pretty quickly. We'll go into a lot more detail about how to use these models in future videos, but let's conclude by talking a little bit about what AIs are good at and bad at. And there's a lot of subtlety here, but it can be helpful to think of the AI as being like working with a human, maybe an intern or a TA, something we'll talk about more, because they've been trained on human knowledge. They don't work the way you would expect a computer to work. They work more the way you expect a human to work. So they make mistakes like humans. They're good at human tasks. You interact with them like people a lot. They're not sentient. They're not people, but they can feel like people when you work with them. And that can be a useful analogy to work with. So what AIs are good at is really human stuff. They're really good at writing and analysis. They're good at creative tasks, creating images. They're great at coding and working with data. They're really good at summarizing results. And they're also really good if you give them clear instructions. So because these are general purpose technologies that can do so many different things, you can make these foundational models into teachers, into office assistants, into editors by giving them the right instructions. And again, we'll talk about how to prompt them to do that in the future. And they're also really good where AI has the tools to accomplish something. So you have to really understand what tools are available to an AI. What do I mean by that? Well, 
until very recently, there was no way to get ChatGPT to have access to the internet. So if you asked it for any information since 2021, when it was trained, it would give you the wrong answers or make up answers. Today, there are starting to be internet connections for those tools, so they'll be able to get more recent information. Similarly, Bing has always been connected to the internet. It's much better when it integrates searches as is barred. And Bing right now allows you to create images directly from the AI itself. So if you ask it to do that, it will do a good job at that. So you have to understand what tools and capabilities are available to each AI and then take advantage of that. Each of them has a very different personality, a little bit different approach, and you have to kind of learn those approaches just like you would learn to work with different humans. But there are some downsides as well as upsides. The first downside is that the AI can make stuff up. It can hallucinate, meaning that it can give you plausible responses that sound convincing, but because there's no there there and it doesn't know what it's saying, it can pull out information that is wrong or subtly wrong. And it's really important for you as a user to evaluate and critically evaluate all of the output that it's giving you and make your own decisions. The second thing that's wrong is that the AI prompt doesn't give you the same output all the time. It can change outputs uh, on any given day. And because these systems are changing so quickly, um, they can be radically different as well. And the third point is sort of a summary of everything we've been talking about. So you have to walk this fine line between the AI being incredibly capable, but also not being magical. So it can't do everything. And it doesn't do everything equally well. If you tell it that it is Warren Buffett, it's not going to give you amazing investment advice, although it might look like it's giving you amazing investment advice. If you tell it it's Marvin Gaye, it may not be able to write a song at the ability of Marvin Gaye. If you tell it to be Steve Jobs and critique your business plan, it's not really invoking Steve Jobs. So you have to be aware of the fact that it's fooling you to some extent, that it's actually creating great content, but some of it is not as great as you think. And you have to be very aware of the strengths and weaknesses, which is why our big advice is use AI. You need to use these systems enough to understand understand how they work, where they work, and where they don't work. So we're going to talk to you in just a bit about some of the techniques you can use prompt AI to do things, but you should really need to practice. Only by using enough hours can you really start to understand what they're good at, what they're bad at, and where you might be deceived. As Ethan just said in our next video, we're going to talk about prompting. How do you get the AI to do what you'd like it to do?